Welcome back to Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bolbok and I'm coming to you from the Mosaic Work Studios. And today what I have to you, for you is a reaction to an article that was that I found out about from Sleepy Folks. A very interesting article. We will talk about corn on the cob and object-oriented programming or styles of programming. So stay tuned. This is the last video I'm recording in advance to our move to the new office. And this will come out on, uh, on the second week. So basically after we've been one week in a new office. This is just in case the move to the office doesn't work as smoothly as we think. And just in case the studio equipment is not set up properly when we get there. So just to give us enough time. But so just that you know that in case um, there are some reactions to the previous videos, um, this one has been recording in advance. So it's actually um, I cannot respond to things that have happened after <laughs> today. Anyway, let's get back to it. Um, in a previous video, I was talking about the idea of type safety and how to program with hidden types. And I mentioned that one of the answer came from Sleepy Fox. We had Sleepy Fox on this channel with a very interesting conversation. He's a very interesting character. And he pointed me to an article that basically it was saying that types offer no benefits in terms of defect injection rate. And the reality is that some people think better with types and some without. It really is a personal and team preference. It's just like analysts versus algebraists. And then he pointed me to a very interesting article that I'd like to talk about next. And this article is called Analyst versus Algebra Predicts It in Corn. <laughs> and it's a very funny article. Um, it starts by saying that broadly speaking, mathematicians can be divided into those who like analysis and those who like algebra. The distinction between the two types runs throughout math. Even those who work in areas that are far from analysis and algebra are very aware of the difference between them and usually are very clear on which their preference is. I'll delve into this in more depth soon, but for now, let's just take it for granted that this is a well-known distinction and it has meaning for mathematicians. All right, and then it goes into a very interesting story that he was in grad school and there was a department lunch and there was corn on the cob. Partway through the meal, one of the analysts looked around the room and remarked, that's odd. All of the analysts are eating corn one way and the algebraists are eating corn another. Everyone looked around. In fact, everyone was eating the corn in one of two ways. One way was to munch over the length of the corn in a straight line back up, turn slightly and do another row across. So kind of row, turn, row, turn, row. The other way was to go around in a spiral. The way I understand this is basically start here and kind of move, yeah, move around, so keep rotating. And all the analysts were eating in spirals and the algebra is in rows. Okay, this is a very weird coincidence. And then he goes into analyzing this a bit more. There were a number of mathematicians present whose field of study didn't make it clear whether they were on the analysis or algebra side of things. We went around and asked. Fun thing, funny thing to be in university, right? And in every case, the way they eat corn matched their preference. Since then, I've made a point of amusing myself by asking mathematicians I meet whether they prefer algebra or analysis, and then predicting which way they will eat corn. I'm probably up to 40 or so by now, and in every case but one, I've been able to correctly predict how they eat corn. 
The one exception was a logician who claimed to be exactly on the fence between the two. When I explained the corn thing to him, he looked surprised and said that I had an unusual way of eating corn. He went in loose spirals. In other words, he truly was a perfect combination of algebra and analysis. And this is a very funny coincidence. And he goes into explaining how this coincidence is quite difficult to explain other than there is a strong connection. And then uh, the interesting part is the analysis. How do I explain the distinction between algebra and analysis? The best way to understand it is to ask you to study advanced mathematics. You'll have to take many courses with the word algebra in the name and other with analysis in the name. By the time you are done, you'll have experienced the difference and you'll be clear on which you prefer. Odds are you won't do that, but it is, this is the most reliable way to come to understand it. I've actually done in university both analysis and algebra courses, um, quite a few, so maybe I'm in this target. If I have to wave my hands and explain it, I would explain it like this. This is actually what I find very interesting part. In algebra, there are sequences of operations which have proven to be important and effective in one circumstance. Algebraists try to reuse these operations in different contexts in the hopes that what proved effective in one situation will be effective again. So kind of like patterns. Right? By contrast, an analyst is likely to form an idiosyncratic medical sorry, idiosyncratic mental model of specific problems. Based on that mental model, you have intuitions that let you carry out long chains of calculations that are in principle obviously going to lead to the right thing. Typically, your intuition is correct to within a constant factor. And you are only interested in some sort of limiting behavior, so that is fine. <coughs> If you don't know any advanced math, the words are about equal, that my explanation is going to mislead you or give you an idea what I'm talking about. Right, so this makes more sense to people who have done mathematics. So one thing in Romania, which I'm not sure happens in many other countries, is that I've studied both algebra and analysis in high school. And then of course, the basics of it, but quite quite in depth. I mean, when we look at, we we've, we've done some calculus, uh, integration, and so on, and we've also done a lot of algebra. And in university, I went on to do things like linear algebra and advanced analysis. So that's when we started doing things like partial derivatives and um, curve integrals and uh, how they call multiple level integrals you know, in multiple dimensions and so on. <clears throat> so I've done both and I kind of get what they are talking about, although the way we learn math was mostly about certain problems, certain theorems that you proved, and not so much about practical applications. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. My my even when going through these experiences doesn't fully. I I don't fully grasp this difference that he's explaining. Um. But now the interesting part is the thing, and actually why I think we are here, is because it feeds up into programming. So the next observation is, for instance, I've noticed the difference cropping up in programming. The distinction is often hard to explain. There are a wide variety of programming techniques, and most programmers have only really learned a few. I've actually done uh, work on different paradigms and techniques, so it's interesting to see what 
is talking about. Some of those techniques appeal to analysts and adult to algebraists, but if you've only been exposed to techniques that are good fit for one, then how do you know which you'd prefer? Worse yet, when two programmers talk and have different experience bases, how can they tell whether their natural and intellectual tastes are similar or different? Let me give you some examples. Upon my first encounter, it was clear to me that object-oriented programming is something that appeals to algebraists. So if you are a programmer and found design patterns elements of reusable object-oriented software, the book by Gengafor, to be a revelation, it is highly likely that you lean towards algebra and eat your core in neat rows. Going the other way, if the techniques described in on Lisp appeal, then you might be on the analytical side of the fence and eat your corn in spirals. So this is um, functional versus object-oriented programming. And I kind of get what is coming from um, with <coughs> algebraists so what he was talking about is that you have reusable things so like patterns you have patterns you have objects something like this um, the other way around is to think how you can find functions that are more and more general that kind of fit together there was a period that i thought that the programming division might be as simple as functional versus object-oriented. Then I encountered monads and I learned that there were functional programmers who clearly were algebraists. Yeah. So, monads indeed are a different kind of beast, right? I know someone who got his PhD studying Haskell's type system. My prediction that he ate corn in rows was correct. <laughs> Going the other way, I wouldn't be surprised that people who love what they can do with template metaprogramming in C++ lean towards analysis and it in cornea spirals. I haven't tested the last guess at all, so take it with a grain of salt. Going out on a limb, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that where people fall in the Emacs VI debate is correlated with how they eat corn. I wouldn't predict a very strong correlation, but I expect that Emax is likely to appear to, to appeal to people who like algebra and VI to people who like analysis. And let's go to the end of the article. There's one more piece that I think is interesting, and then let me give you some reaction to it. Uh, why would how we eat corn say something about how we think? Here is what I think. When you pick up a piece of corn on the cob, you have two cues for how to eat it. The first is that the corn is laid out in very nice rows. How can you not follow the lines that are laid out for you? The other is that as you eat, your teeth scrape down the corn. If you twist your wrist, you lead more efficiently. Why would someone want to eat inefficiently? My best guess is that the cue you notice and follow reflects a natural tendency about how you tend to think in general. And this tendency is tied to such things as what kind of math you prefer or what programming techniques would prove interesting for you. All right, so very interesting article. And this got me thinking what I prefer and where I sit here. <clears throat> First of all, I've loved maths uh, in high school and actually all through high school and then in university i was more focused on programming i wasn't that into math anymore but from the two main disciplines i think i, I loved algebra more um, it was more intuitive to me uh, than the advanced analysis techniques like when you st when we started to do things on mm, in two and three dimensions uh, integrals and when we were doing curve integrals and things like that that wasn't that interesting to me i kind of got why we were doing it uh, part of it is about um <clears throat> working with 
objects that are not flat <laughs> so it makes sense and working with evolutions of functions in multiple dimensions <clears throat> but if i were to make a list of preference of what i really love in math first of all it would be integer numbers and equations with integer numbers and things like that i find that fascinating that would be if i were to do math now and to study math i think that would be my area of preference it's it has always been fascinating to me how you have numbers that have relations between them um, like prime numbers and then you have all kinds of different numbers with different properties um, i remember being incredibly fascinating by perfect numbers for example perfect numbers are numbers who when you add up all their prime factors you end up with the number uh, the first example is 6. 6 has 3 factors, 1, 2, and 3, and if when you add 1, 2, and 3, you get 6. And the second one, the second type of number, which is kind of related, is uh, friend numbers, or friendly numbers. Um, when so you take two numbers and the factor prime factors of one when you add up they give you the other and the other way around um, and i think two examples are 220 and 284 another and everything related to prime numbers is fascinating to me these are kind of the building blocks of numbers and we don't know a lot about their properties. We know some things and we have some conjectures, but there, I think there's still a lot more to learn. And, um, well, I guess you got it. Also equations in integer numbers. Those are very, very interesting. I remember reading the story of a, how to solve a problem um, and the method to solve it in in real no, in uh, integer numbers was really interesting you you'd start fr from something approximating a solution but not actually being the solution and kind of do a bunch of transformations until you ended up with um, an equation well, not the equation, uh, a computation in integer numbers that was precisely matching the equation and then identify the solution based on that. And it had multiple solutions and so on. Very interesting method. Uh, so it goes beyond the things you can try with integer number equations go beyond what you do with um when you go into the whole uh, domain of, of numbers. So you got it, I'm very interested in numbers. Second, geometry. I love geometry in two dimensions, in three dimensions, and also was interested in variations of geometry like curved spaces and so on. Uh, very cool part of it unfortunately would be <laughs> using operations from calculus uh, to deal with that but yeah that's and only then third place would be analysis um, and as you can see i i can remember uh, straight out of my head how to do you know things about numbers and geometry if I try, uh, I can definitely do a, de a derivative um, and compute it, but I don't remember the techniques for integral calculus. I'll probably remember them if I would go back to, to it, but 
it's not something that I would really want to do, that I really feel like, like it's a very interesting thing. So you get the point. I think this places me more on the algebra side of things. <clears throat> and um, the way I eat corn is actually in rows, which, is, which fits this description. And I like object-oriented programming. Um, I've tried functional programming of different types. I've actually even wrote a book about functional programming in C++, which was my way of teaching others, you know, this is how functional programming, this is how you can learn functional programming, even though uh, the way it was taught to me as university was not that great. Uh, and you can probably by reading this book, figure out how to do functional programming. And it's not only for C++. So examples are in C++, but the basic techniques are mm, the same for any modern language. Um, very few things are specific to C++ there. And, but it's not the thing that I'm directly jumping into. Um, passing a function from now and then to another uh, function. This is something that I do, but I do it mostly for the common operations on collections. Like I love map, I like reduce, I love join, uh, all these kind of uh, typical operations that you that come from functional programming and that work really well. But other than that, I find functional programming to be quite difficult to read, to understand and to change, even though it's probably more flexible in the right ways. Uh, but it is, I, at least for me, from my personal preference, it's a bit harder. Uh, to to understand it's it would be easy to develop but it's harder to get back to already written code that's my main challenge with it <clears throat> so this is where I stand and I actually found monads very interesting as an idea And I think they are they are quite yeah an interesting concept. It's not something that I may be using every day, but I'm definitely seeing them more like a design pattern that you can use when you need them. All right, makes sense. All right. So everything up to here was fitting fitting me perfectly until we got to VI and Emacs. I actually tried Emacs. Uh, some time ago. And I tried VI. And honestly, I don't like Emacs that much. I don't like... The thing I didn't like was the pet, the long sequence of commands. Uh, that you needed to remember. I like much more the VI style, which indeed is more functional in nature, but to me it makes more sense. I, it's easier to remember for me. So everything fits until VI versus Emacs. So, this is a quick reaction to this article, very interesting article, very odd connection, one that I find um, intriguing. Um, I think it connects to the way I write code, which I described in the previous video, with hidden types. 
and yeah i can only thank uh sleepy fox for pointing me in, in the direction of this article which raised some very interesting uh and intriguing possibilities so what do you think about this let us know in the comments and until next time remember to think design and work smart